The sermon, the sermon today is entitled Faith in the Good Lord Jesus. I could have said Faith in Our Good Lord Jesus. And so the scripture reading today will be by Gillian Elias. Uh, it will be from Romans 10, 1 to 15. And uh, so I'll leave it to Gillian. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not a I've lost you, Julian. Oh. No, I... Okay, we hear you well now. Maybe you want to begin again? Okay. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer for God, prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about right, the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between the Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him of whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. This is the inspired word of God. Thank you for confirming again that Jesus is the center of the center. Amen. And as we look at this section of the book of Romans, it is important to have an overview of what this letter is, how this letter is structured. Otherwise, it would be like trying to understand the book by reading a few pages in the middle of the book. And the following is the framework uh, on which the Book of Roman hangs. Uh, first of all, the gospel as the revelation of the righteousness of God from uh, in Revelation in Romans one. Then we have God's righteousness and His wrath against sinners in uh, Romans one eighteen to three twenty. Then we have the saving righteousness of God three twenty one to four twenty five. Then we have the hope. Hope as a result of righteousness by faith, uh, 5 1 to 8 39. And then God's righteousness to Israel and to the Gentiles in 9 1 to 11 36. God's righteousness in everyday life, uh, John, uh, Romans 12 1 to 15 13. And the extension of God's righteousness through the Pauline mission, 15 14 to 15 uh, to the end of chapter 15. And the final summary of the gospel of the righteousness of God in um, 1625 to 27. And the section that we will continue to focus on today is the section of God's righteousness to Israel and to the Gentile. Uh, we will focus especially on verses 10 to 15 or, or, or 5 to 15 of chapter 10. And just as a background, the letter to the Romans was written in AD 56 to 57 AD. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote this letter in the winter while in a house in Corinth. His third missionary journey was coming to an end at that time. 
And according to Acts 20 and verse 3, Paul spent three months in the house of Gaius as a guest. And at that time, the apostle Paul had visited most of the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire, preaching Christ and establishing young communities of Christians, building, up in, building them up into holiness and harmony. The letters he had written previously concerned problems and needs of the local church. But about 20 years in the ministry and having much experience as a missionary, he dictated a letter to Tertius, giving his mature thoughts about God's gospel for the world and its place in the history and in society. And from Rome, the capital of the Gentile world, he was planning to set out from there to go to Spain. And in this new venture, he would need the support of the house churches in Rome for prayer, personal financial, finances, and initial contacts. And Paul was not the founder of the church in Rome. Uh, this letter is an epistle of introduction to the Roman churches. He writes to them ahead of his planned voyage to visit them. And the theme of the letter to the Romans is the revelation of God's judging and saving righteousness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the cross of Christ, God judges sins, sin, and at the same time manifests his saving mercy. And Paul's letter focused on the Jew and Gentile relationship or issues, and that suggests that there were tensions between the, Jew, the Jews and the Gentiles in Rome. The church in Rome had probably begun as a Jewish church, although it is not known exactly how it was established. And in AD, uh, in 49 AD, Claudius expelled the Jews because of strife over Christus, over Christ. In, and we read about that in Acts 18 too. And because of the expulsion of the Jews, the church in Rome would have been made mostly of Gentiles. And it's easy to, to see that there would have been tension between the Christian Jews and the Christian Gentiles. The Gentile Christians live free of the restriction of, in, of the law of Moses. The Jews still had attachment to the ritual laws of Moses. In his letter, the Apostle Paul showed how the gospel unified Christians from all backgrounds. Paul's intent in writing to the Romans was to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of Christ's name, as we read in 1.5. So as we consider God's plan for humanity, his purpose is to bring glory and praise to his name. And uh, I took these facts from the ESV Study Bible and from the International Bible Commentary, edited by F.F. F. Bruce. And so the Apostle Paul's desire and prayer is for the salvation of the Jews. And this is important. That is what is driving Paul as he writes this letter. And Paul acknowledges that the Jews had a zeal for God. However, their zeal was based on erroneous knowledge. They did not understand and were ignorant of the righteousness of God. Rather than submit to his righteousness, they thought they could become righteous by observing the law of the Old Covenant of the Old Testament. And we can certainly identify with that uh, as we look at our history. <laughs> and, it, and it just shows the importance as well of having right teachings based on the cornerstone of Jesus Christ and what the writing of the apostles, the, the gospel of uh, the four gospels. It's very important to understand the link between the Old and the New Testament, because otherwise, if we veer off that, we can end up into all kinds of erroneous thinking. And God is, we don't see yet perfectly everything. God is guiding us. We still see through a, a mirror darkly. So the learning process and the growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus is an ongoing process, which never ceases. Um, so the Apostle Paul is very clear that Jesus is the end of the law and the source of righteousness for everyone who believes on him. And righteousness has to be given by Jesus and received as a gift, 
no amount of human effort will ever make us righteous before God. And this is difficult for us as human beings to, to accept this. It takes a, a miracle for us to detach ourselves from our work and realize that all the saving is done by God in Christ Jesus through his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection as a perfect human being. Because we have the tendency to, to think, well, if it's too good to be true, it must, there must be some catch or it, it's probably not. But in this situation, this gift is not too good to be true because it is the truth as, exposed, as expound by, expounded by uh, Jesus, as expounded by the, Holy, by the apostles, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit. In chapters 12 to 15, uh, chapters 12 to 15 show us very clearly how we are to live practically in the grace of God as we live in his gift of righteousness. You know, some will say, well, if you say that, that it's all of God and none of us, people will jump to the conclusion, well, you know, it's okay to say and it's okay to, to live as we want to and all that kind of erone erroneous thinking, but uh, in chapters 12 to 15 of Romans, it shows it's quite the opposite. It, we have now the freedom to obey God, to live in righteousness, to live as God's children. And the Apostle Paul makes it very clear that living in God's righteousness and grace is not a permission to live a life of sin. It is simply not. So the difference between righteousness based on the law and righteousness based on faith, because in this section of scripture, the apostle Paul quotes from the Old Testament extensively. In verse 5, when the apostle Paul quotes what Moses has written about the righteousness based on the law, he quotes Leviticus 18.5. And there was a, um, a heresy early on in the, about the, around the 5th century or around that time where it was saying that, you know, the God of the Old Testament was not the God of the New and just denying the Old Testament. But as we read the Apostle Paul and the Epistle to the Romans and his other epistles, we, realize, we see the importance of the Old Testament and how it all pointed to Jesus. But in Leviticus 18, it says, You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. And certainly in the Old Testament, it was a focus on doing. And again, in verse 6, uh, he says, But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. And if you look, he is quoting Deuteronomy 30, 11 to 13. And he is, he's basically telling them that they do not have to complicate things. <laughs> that God is near us. God lives in us. God uh, the quote in, in Deuteronomy, then he quotes Deuteronomy 10, 14. He says, but the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. But Paul, as he, everything pointed to Christ. So as now has Christ has come, he changes the wording. And he said, he, he changes the wording of you can do it. He says, that is the word of faith that we proclaim. And it's all, it's now, it's based on grace. It's based on accepting in faith what Jesus has done for us. The Old Testament was focused on physical promises, uh, mostly, although it pointed to, to Jesus, his coming and everything else. But the core of the Old Testament was on, you do, you get physical blessings, you don't do you get curses as we read in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 5. And then he goes on to point 
to Jesus in verse 9. He says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So the center of the Christian life is Jesus. Jesus is the prophesied chosen stone. He's a precious cornerstone, a solid foundation. And again, we see that in the Old Testament where it pointed to Jesus. I'd just like to read that to you from the ESV and then from the New American Standard Version. Therefore, thus, say, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. And the New American Standard Version says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. And we know that this is pointing to Jesus. Jesus is the end of the law. There's no other. And of course, we know that Jesus said the same thing about himself when he came down to the earth. In Matthew, he says very clearly that he's come to fulfill the law and the prophets in Matthew 5.17. Jesus is the firm foundation. There is no other foundation to be laid for salvation other than the crucified and risen Christ. And what is so offensive to the world is, the, is that the Bible tells us very clearly there is no other way to receive the gift of salvation other than by, by believing and trusting in Jesus. It's very exclusive, isn't it? When we, when we say that, that the only way to be saved is to believe and have faith in Christ. It eliminates, therefore, all others. And that is quite offensive to people who have not yet come to faith, who do not know Jesus. And it was the same, to, it's the same today as it was in Paul's time. In 1 Corinthians 1.23, he says, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and folly to the Gentiles. And again, this is how it's seen in the world today, that more and more, especially in our, in our century, where Christianity is often seen as irrelevant, as backward, as, as not applying to life, and all these various arguments that, that, are being, that are being said and as people live apart from God. And then he goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 1.18, he says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So we are in the process of being saved, but people who do not know, for to them it's folly that... God, the creator of the universe, would come down to the earth to become one of us. The creator lowering himself to the created. It's just unbelievable for people in the world. And in just saying those words that Jesus is the only name under heaven by whom one may be saved, it eliminates all religious approaches that exist in the world as a way of being right with God. The only way to be right with God is to believe in Jesus. There's no other way. If you will, Jesus is God's bottom line. Jesus is God's bottom line. He is the one who makes sense of all that we see in our world, all we see in the church, all that we see in this often difficult life. So look at Jesus. He is the light that shines, that shows us how we are to be in him. And this is what he has revealed to his church. And we are to clearly cling to him. We are, as Mr. William said, we are to stay in the boat. 
he's never going to leave the boat. That's where we are safe. He's what, whatever the storm around us, Jesus is always there, never leaves us, never forsakes us. That is very important to, to believe and to live by and because it makes all the difference. And I know as Christians, we are not spared from suffering. We are all prone to death, physical death. And if we are grieving, and many of us have lost very dear ones in our lives, in spite of the hurt that we may experience, in spite of the mourning and the grief, we are to look beyond the grief and look to Jesus as our refuge, our strength, and our comfort. We are to mourn, but not to mourn and grieve with hope. But we are to mourn and grieve with hope at the loss of a loved one. We, because we, we know that their spirit has gone back to God. And God is a merciful and just God. And he loves people. He, everyone who receives his gift of righteousness, who received the gift of Jesus, actually, will have eternal life through faith. Or if we are experiencing family problems, we are to look beyond the family problems and look to Jesus. There are so many things we cannot change on our own. God has to intervene in his grace because we know again that God loves people. He has their best interest in mind. Just as he has worked and continues to work in our lives, we pray that he will work in other people's lives to bring about his purposes for them. And we know that these problems are temporary because when Jesus returns to, his, to this earth, it will be the end of all tears, of crying, of pain and suffering of all sorts. In his grace, as far as it depends on us, we are to live in peace and harmony with others. Even with the best of our intentions, because we live in a fractured world, there is often division in our families, and with our significant relationships, whether at work, in our neighborhood, extended family, or whatever. But in all these situations, we need to realize that we are in God's both, that we are in the boat with Jesus. Jesus knows exactly where he is guiding us. And he tells us that when we look at the Bible, it it points of innumerable people being saved in the book of Revelation. The promise to Abraham are just stupendous. More than the sand of the sea, he says, are, are going to be blessed to Abraham. Not too long ago, we had someone living as our neighbor who was a thief, he stole from many people in our neighborhood until he was stopped by the police. And we all experience these things from time to time. It happens in our neighborhood, happened probably in your neighborhood. I know in the Moncton area, it's happening in the richer part of Moncton where people are getting their, people have to log their cars, log their homes, check everything else because there are thieves there as well who have stolen cars, who have ransack houses and you know those things happen we in spite of all of this we are to look to Jesus in spite of the COVID and the isolation that we are all forced to live to a certain point we are to look to Jesus if we are sick we are to look beyond our sickness and illnesses and look to Jesus as our healer because one day this suffering will end we will be given a new body a spiritual body, a re uh, completely transformed body, free from sin, free from sinness, as the bride of Christ. If we are suffering because of financial pressures, we are to look to Jesus to be our strength, realizing that he will never forsake us or leave us. And I know these things are difficult when we go through these trials, but it's even more difficult if we go through these trials without Jesus, because as we go through these trials, 
and look to Jesus and thank him. You know, he, he says that he's going to give us a peace that surpasses understanding. And he does. That's encouraging. And we have to realize that the suffering of this present age is nothing compared to the glory that awaits us in Jesus Christ. Whatever we may go through, we know God is with us, perfecting us to be in the likeness of Jesus. He is the perfect man sitting in authority at the throne of God, the firstborn among many brethren. We are not in charge of those outcomes. God is. And that is encouraging as we live by faith because it, it becomes real then. There's unity in the church. There's to be unity in the church. This is what Paul talked about. And in Joel 3.32, he quotes, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, in the Old Testament, God worked mostly with Israel and more specifically with the Jews in preparation for the coming of Jesus. And the Old Testament contains prophecy about great changes that were, to, that were to occur, that were to come about as God worked with all people without distinction. In the Old Testament, it is prophesied that nations from all parts of the world would come to worship our Lord. You can read about that in Isaiah, for example. The Apostle Paul quotes the prophet Joel to show that God is fulfilling his promise. He makes it clear that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It does not matter their nationality, whether they be Jew or Greek. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Because Jesus is the Lord of all people. He is the sustainer of everyone's physical life, as we read in Acts 17. Paul wrote, He himself gives to all mankind, to all mankind, life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. In him we live and move and have our being. We are then God's offspring. And he's talking to unconverted Greeks in Athens. We are all God's offspring. That is encouraging. In this, in the Roman church, Roman Christians had a tendency to see themselves as being superior to the Jews. And reading from God's point of view, the Apostle Paul is leveling the ground. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And this is quite a high calling for Christians to see all people according to the flesh with the mind of Christ. Because there's an old saying, birds of a feather fly, fly together or flight together. It basically means that people who have the same values and interests tend to gather together. And in the news lately, there has been a great emphasis on racism. Unfortunately, a racism has existed since the fall of man. And as God's people, although we acknowledge our racial, linguistic, ethnic differences, we are to accept one another in a loving and respected manner. Because who created the nations? Who created the differences? God did. Because in Christ, all those boundaries break down. Whatever the color, whatever the language, whatever the ethnic background, when called by God, our calling is all the same. We all have been bought with the precious blood of Christ. And we have to be to remember and be cognizant of the fact that the creator of the various races is God himself. It is he who created Caucasians, black and brown people. He has given different talents to different people. And we are not to compare ourselves with, other, with one another, as, God, as the Apostle Paul writes. 
God has created these differences and he's creating a beautiful tapestry which we will experience at the human resurrection of our bodies. Jesus did not die for one race in particular. He died for everyone. And these are precious truths God is revealing to us. In God's plan, how will people know of God's wonderful inclusion of humanity in Christ? Well, he tells us how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns in Isaiah 52, 7. In Romans 15, Paul says, and how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Again, everything in the Old Testament was pointing to Christ. It's pointing to Jesus. It was pointing to the work that he would, done with, would do with human beings and the work that he is doing in the church now. And God works through his people to make others know the good news of the gospel of Jesus. Because Jesus is the way. He's the door. He's the gate to the Father's throne. There's no other way. This means that he works, that he works through us his church in whatever denomination we find ourselves as Christians to call people to himself. Because that's what he promised in John 12, 32. He says, when I'm raised up, I will call all everyone to myself. I'm just paraphrasing here. But this is, bas this is basically what he says. And this is certainly something that we can pray. That God will give us the wisdom to share with others who Jesus is, because Jesus is the good news. God is the one who opens the mind. He works through his people to sow the seed, to water the seed, and he is the one who makes the seed grow. You know, we have a, a vine in the backyard. I talked about that before. We cut it right down to the root. And you should see how it's grown just since June. It's over the fence now. Now, we don't see it grow. You know, if we look at it, we don't see it move. But we get up in the next morning and wow, it's just growing. It's growing every day. And it's like that in, the, in God's church. The church is growing everywhere. And so he shares this good news through his people, through the church. But on some occasions, we, Jesus works in all kinds of ways. He works through dreams and visions. And I was reading an article uh, by Derek Garland that you can find on the internet. Um, Muslim experience Jesus Christ through dreams and vision is the title of the article. He says, I first heard about it from an Egyptian pastor of a church in Cairo that Muslims were converting to Christianity after seeing Jesus Christ in dreams and visions. Then I heard the same thing from other sources through the mission department of our church, professor at Fuller Theological Seminary, executive at the Outreach Foundation Christianity Today. The Williams Carey School of World Missions, books, articles, and over a million reports on the internet. The, the, this well-documented phenomenon reflects a number of common situations. The conversions have been happening for decades, they occurred in close countries where the Christian gospel is not known and where converting to Christianity often results in persecution and death. The men and women who have these dreams or visions have never had contact with Christians before the dreams or visions. The dreams or visions come to men and women who are earnestly seeking to know and, and, and to please God. And of course, we know that that is all God initiated all initiated by the Holy Spirit. And the person in the vision, Jesus, wears white or radiates light. The dreams happen while they sleep. The vision happen while they are awake. And after experiencing the dreams and visions, these Muslims go outside of their communities 
to seek out a Christian or obtain a Bible to learn more about Jesus. And after deciding to follow Jesus, many of these former Muslims are persecuted, but they experience further dreams and visions of Jesus who encourages them to persevere in their faith in him. And there's the example of a Turk. There are several examples, but there's an example of a Turkish man. His name is Ali. Uh, this Tur Turkish man in bondage to alcohol and desperate to overcome his addiction moved to Saudi Arabia where alcohol is forbidden. However, he still found alcohol there and resumed his drinking. Hoping to be freed of his addiction and be led in the way of a true Muslim, he made a pilgrimage to Mecca. To his surprise, he met Jesus Christ in a dream instead and followed him. How would you expect that a, a Muslim would meet, Jesus would meet a Muslim in Mecca? But he did. And there are, as, 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 as this author says, there are, you can see various sources and they all say the same thing. These things are true. They, they happen. Although we in the Western world don't tend to take dreams seriously and seldom experience God in dreams or vision, we really ought to, for there are many places in the Bible where God appeared to people in dreams and visions, and the words of both the prophet Joel and the apostle Peter serve to remind us that in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all peoples. Your son and your daughter shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions in Joel 2.28 and 2.17. So what happens is that these people, when Jesus calls them, they look to know Jesus better, and then they look for other Christians. God guides them to his church. He does not guide them to individual experiences. He guides them to his church. That is an amazing miracle. Because God is reaching out to people of all tribes and nations in various ways. But to those who are shut off and forbidden to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, God is revealing Jesus Christ to them through dreams and visions. Jesus is the true Lord. We can trust him completely. In his incarnation, he is the embodiment of love for us and love for humanity. So as God's people, let us stay in the boat. Let us continue to believe and trust in Jesus. So with adoration and thanksgiving, let us pray. And I'll just 